Good morning everyone, my name is Sarah Doherty and I am the Marketing and Event Coordinator here at Hornbill. I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar where we'll be having a presentation on simplifying the challenges of modern ITSM with Stephen Boardman, Product Manager, and Simon Cooper from the new business, from the new business team. Just to inform you, Delegate Auto will be muted during the presentation to help facilitate flow and timekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the GoToMeeting question facility on the right-hand side of your screen. We will collate questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you for taking the time to attend. I will now pass you over to Stephen and Simon. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for this webinar around simplifying the challenges of ITSN. What we intend to do over the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes is to uh, explain some of the challenges that we've identified with working with our customer base, and then Steve's going to show how we deal with those challenges through Service Manager. So without any further ado, I'm just going to quickly run through those challenges, and uh, then we'll pass over to Steve. What we would ask is if there's any questions, please forward them, because at the end of the session, we'll be doing a Q&A session as well. So without further ado, let's just start looking at these. So again, what I want to talk about initially is some of the challenges. Now, the key challenges, these are what we've identified over probably the last five years. We're talking to our customers um, as a vendor, and these challenges that they've highlighted to us have been consistently portrayed to us. And what we've tried to do is put them into five distinct areas. Now, again, these challenges are not unique to delivering a service management, and they generally go across the board of actually delivering software. But again, if we just look at them, the first area that consistently comes up is around upgrades. Uh, our customers say cuts, um, upgrades are expensive, they're time consuming. And again, a lot of the time um, with the upgrades, they're not something that is seen as a cost going forward, but, it, but they end up being so. And again, what we find is with many organizations, the longer you leave it between the version you're on and the present version that the vendor offers, the gap widens. And again, these upgrades become cost inhibitive going forward to so much that um, organizations actually go back to market as well. And again, upgrades isn't just unique to on-premise, it affects uh, the SaaS world as well. Following on from that, customizations. Now, no service management solution is going to be 100% fit. And again, the, uh, by the nature of them, service management solutions are highly customizable. But what comes out of the back of that is um, an overhead in actually supporting those um, solutions and actually maintaining them going forward and what we do find is a lot of organizations is when they actually go to upgrade some of the customizations don't reapply and some of them don't work as they originally intended to so again customizations and upgrades go in hand in hand the third area of challenge is complexity now as i said the the service management solutions can be highly configurable but there's also the complexity of owning them within your organization because it's not just the application um, is the infrastructure to make, maintain that solution and also integration with other tools as well that provide that solution. And what comes out of that complexity is a high degree of knowledge that's needed within your organization. And for a lot of organizations, it may not just be one person that supports that. But when, if that person's promoted or moves on, suddenly there's a gap that's left within your organization. And to build in resilience around that, there's a need for training. And again, training of those experts can be a costly and timely exercise to maintain the service management solution within your organization. Usability. Um, essentially, um, service management solutions are powerful, but a lot of comment that's come back from talking to customers is that they're not that intuitive to use. Um, a lot of the solutions consumer apps we use outside of our business environment um, are certainly intuitive and easy to use. And a lot of people are starting to say that they wish to see them appear more within the business environment. Now, a couple of other areas that I uh, just wanted to touch upon is communication, effective communication. A lot of organizations say that they use this service management tool for call logging, but a lot of the other activities occur outside of that. And one of those is email. So essentially, emails um, are sent from the analyst to the end user and vice versa, but they're never recorded in real time. And sometimes, they're not actually at, um, put back into the system as well. And the output from the service management solutions is gaining ma meaningful reports. A lot of our customers talk about having to export data into Excel spreadsheet, 
push the information out into other tools. And it's just not that continuity of actually using the solution consistently. And what comes out of that is total cost of ownership. A lot of solutions, as they become more expensive, they're more costly to maintain and implement. And the business is constantly asking for the cost to be driven down, um, higher quality of service given to customers. And what we do find as well is sometimes that the IT, the IT tooling um, is sometimes the last time where you actually see investment. So again, what we're sort of hi highlighting here is that the cost of the solution can go up and also there are some hidden costs around training and implementation that not, not necessarily come to the fore when you're actually looking to um, purchase a new, new tool. So what have we done at Horn? But well, what we've done is, is built around a simple yet powerful idea. About five years ago, we took time to actually reflect on the marketplace. And certainly, the way we communicate, the way we engage has changed. And we've also seen the revolution of social media and cloud-based solutions. And what we wanted to do was look at the, the technologies and the techniques. And we wanted to find a way of combining the best practices of ITSM with these collaborative technologies while presenting a friendly but intuitive user interface for organizations and again trying to simplify service management but also the delivery of solutions into us other business areas so what we created was hornbill now hornbill is a collaborative platform that allows you to communicate engage be in contact with colleagues and also be in contact with colleagues in real time so you're able to help with process and also help with capturing of sharing knowledge going forward now, to support the collaborative platform, we've created line of business application. These line of business applications individually are powerful with business process and automation. But equally, if you integrate multiple um, applications, you then have added value and you're able to actually create a solution that's fit for your organization uh, for today, but equally will scale going forward. Now, these business process uh, business applications sit on top of the collaborative platform that I've just shown. So what we intend to do today is to show you the concept of a collaborative service management, which basically involves the collaborative platform. And today, Steve will be looking at showing um, service manager, document manager, and configuration within the demonstration. So the concept is a collaborative approach. And what this gives us the ability within an organization is to share knowledge and ideas more easily, collaborate globally with um, our colleagues and partners, boost productivity, and have the ability to actually do this from anywhere. Now, two areas uh, I just want to touch upon before I hand over to Steve is effective communication. Effective communication is key to our offering. And what we want to give people the ability to communicate from any device at any time, from any location, and equally in any language as well. Having the ability to address the language and location balance barrier is a key feature of our application and again it just helps with providing better service and efficient inefficiencies of driving process through your organization now um, explicit and, and tacit knowledge now we're probably familiar with explicit knowledge which is around um, documented NITO around document management and document processes around process and procedures that are made available internally and externally and again we're probably very used to having that ability to produce FAQs and documents that help the organization. But tacit knowledge is probably maybe something that's slightly less uh, common, but we feel is just as powerful, if not more. Now, tacit knowledge is the here and now, the knowledge that is passed between colleagues and partners that isn't necessarily captured. And a simple example would be, um, I'm sitting on the service desk and I can't find any information, but I know that Steve's an expert on Active Directory. I speak to Steve or I email Steve, a question, Steve emails it back, I pass it on to the, um, the customer to resolve the, the request. But that information is never captured and reused. And we see this is a very powerful asset um, that can actually be used in actually providing a good service. And again, later on, Steve will show the capabilities of actually using tacit knowledge within Service Manager. Now, service, software versus service. Now, this is a key tenant when you're actually looking at buying a new solution. Am I buying a piece of software or a service? Now, with either, what uh, most organizations should be looking at is how is that software written? Um, how are upgrades made available? And how can I take advantage of those um, upgrades? With Hornbill, 
um, we're providing a service which is a native app and we use continual software deployment. Now just to give you a run through of, of, of how we do this, let's say for example developer um, creates a new feature. That feature is then tested, it's then QA and then it's made available to you. So it's along the lines of some of the consumer apps you should be familiar with outside of work, typically Google or Gmail, where functionality is made available to you. It um, helps the product to get better, it keeps working, there's no upgrades and it just continually gets deployed to you and you can take advantage of that. So with Service Manager, no upgrades. Upgrades are automatic so the system just keeps working. It always means you're on the latest features and can take advantage of that. There's no service interruption and finally all your customizations keep working. So again, what, that's, what I've just shown you is uh, I've just gone through some of the features and challenges. Um, we do record this session because I know I've moved through this probably quite quickly, but equally we'll make available to you this recording. Now what I'm going to do is hand over to Steve who will run you through the demonstration. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks Simon and good morning everyone. So as Simon mentioned, I'm just going to spend uh, possibly about 20 minutes just giving you a feel for the service manager functionality and capabilities. So I'm just going to start by having a look at the self-service experience and then we'll come back in and have a look at a, an analyst or a service delivery manager's view and then also wrap up by having a look at the uh, reporting and analytics options that you've got through service manager. <clears throat> so first and foremost, looking at the self-service experience, we do provide uh, self-service port available in any language. It supports transparent single sign-on and it can be customised and brandable codelessly through our admin tool. Each user that logs into the portal will receive a tailored experience based on the services that they are subscribed to, whether those services are provided traditionally by IT or whether they're provided by uh, marketing, finance, HR, whatever it may be, it's going to be a single place for the users to go, or whether they're in fact external services you provide to your external customers. If we take the example here, we're logged in as a particular user, in this case a gentleman called Steve Robinson. Uh, Steve can see the services that he is subscribed to, all of the uh, IT services, or we can look at all of my services, we can expand those out, we can think, see things like finance and my benefits from the various other uh, service providers. I can also then choose to favoritise the services I use most often, I can see services where I have active requests logged against them, and I can also see services where that service provider has already flagged that there's an issue or there's something uh, uh, awry with the provision of that particular service. And if we use that to take one of our sort of typical scenarios to walk you through some of the features that are available here. So first and foremost, I could be working from home, unable to connect to the network. So I might come into the portal and actually see, is there any information that's going to allow me to self-help? So I can drill down into my home working service and I can have a look under the known issues tab. This is where if the service provider team are working with problems and known issues, if they're aware of an issue already, they can publish out that they're aware of that issue. If there's a workaround which they can... Um, impart and allow you to self-help, fantastic, that information can be provided. If there wasn't a workaround, what's the quickest and easiest way for those users to report that they're also affected by this particular issue? Well traditionally they might have to log repeat incidents and the problem management team might have to go looking for those problem, repeat incidents and link them to the existing uh, problem ticket. But here with Service Manager we can simply provide our users with a Me Too option this is going to add that user to the existing problem or known error as an impacted user. It's going to notify the problem team that are looking after that known issue. And going forward, any ongoing communications about workarounds and uh, resolutions for that problem, those impacted users will automatically be notified about. But if there weren't any known issues, have we provided any FAQ content or any knowledge that's going to allow these users to self-help? So on here, we might have provided some videos, we might have had some imagery, we might have had some uh, instructions in terms of how do you resolve this particular issue if you come across it, and all of that's great and useful, and hopefully this again is going to resolve a number of the, or percentage of the issues that customers typically would log with you. But if we use the scenario, there were no known issues, no FAQs that are actually relevant or help me, I'm going to then come in and I'm going to have a look at the request catalogue that's been configured against this particular service, which basically um, contains the options I have as a user to raise against this service. Now I could simply come in here and say actually I want to get a phone, a phone call back from the team that look after our uh, VPN access, I want them to help me. Maybe I haven't even set it up in the first place so I want to schedule in when that's going to happen. 
or if I simply want to report that I'm having that issue, I can go ahead and select the relevant option. I can provide the basic information, so unable to connect. And this is using our progressive capture uh, technology. So here it's just going to be a set of guided or linked questions where I can provide one, two, or multiple sets of information depending on how much data you need to collect. But on doing so, we know which service, which catalog item this is being logged against, so we can use our business process to automatically route that to the correct resolver team, invoke the relevant service level timers, send off confirmation emails and tasks, etc. But what it does for the user, it then gives them visibility or a heads-up display of that underlying business process that the support team are going to follow to, to fulfill and resolve that issue for them. Coming back up to my services, though, and if we take a real-world example here, which is as a business, you might provide 50 or 100 different services to this user. Um, how do they know where to go to log a, uh, a VPN issue against the home working service? If they don't know that, we have to provide a facility to help them. And here across the middle, you'll see a, a federated search bar. And this is going to allow me just to simply come in here and say, what, what, what am I looking to do today? And if I put VPN in here, it's going to show me known issues. It's going to show me FAQs that might match my, uh, my issue. But it's also going to show me catalog items to where I might want to go to report that issue. Or if I was coming in here because I needed a new mobile, I can use the same search facility to say, okay, well, are there any FAQs covering what our company policy is regarding mobiles? And where do I go to request a new mobile device? All of that can be done quickly and easily and will guide me back into that progressive capture experience for me to then go ahead and fill in the questions that are required. Coming back up to the top, you may have also noticed that we have um, some carousel informational bulletins that are going across the center here. These are all notifications that are relevant to the services that, the, that each individual is subscribed to. So the key thing here is that users won't be getting bombarded with noise about things they're not interested in. It's only relevant to the services that they actually consume. Okay. So that's enough at this point looking at the uh, self-service experience. If we drop back in and have a look at this from an analyst point of view or a, uh, a service delivery manager's perspective, the first thing I'll, I'll comment on here is those requests or that request that we just raised from the self-service portal will come in here and I can be notified about that via a, a platform notification like this. I can pick up an email notification um, or I can pick this up on my native iOS and Android apps. We'll come back to all of the news feed in a second, but the, the key aspect is how were those services defined in the first place and why were they available on the self-service portal? And I've just dropped in here to have a look at some of these services that we've defined, and I'll go and have a look at my home working service. Here we can set all the things I'm sure you're expecting to see, you know, describing what the service is, what's its uh, portfolio status, who's subscribed to that service and how are they subscribed, which teams support that service, and that's important when we consider who can I assign tickets to that have been raised against that service, or who has visibility of tickets that have been raised against that service. Is the service private or, um, or, or, or not, in, again, in terms of visibility and access and controls, and the service has either been marked as impacted or not. We can drop in and we can look at the configuration options for any instance or service request logged against that particular service, and the same will be true for changes, problems, and, and known errors. This is where I can come in and do things like form design, choose which categories are going to be selected, but also define those um, request catalog items that we saw on the portal. And inside each of those, we can configure the questions that we want to ask using a progressive capture and any fulfillment business process that we want to link to that particular one. We can also come here to define those bulletins that were on the carousel at the top and where we can go to manage the FAQs that we've created. We can also see what infrastructure or CIs underpin and give us the ability to actually provide that service in the first place. And if we want to explore that service graphically, we can launch the, uh, the uh, graphical view, which is going to show me not only the CIs that underpin it, but all the requests that have been logged against it, any documents or users that have been related, um, and any of those other components we're interested in. If I want to get rid of some of the noise, I can just remove the request from here. And now I can have a look at the hardware and software that underpin that service, which uh, laptops and desktops are hanging off that, uh, that software, and the bi-directional relationships if they've been defined and the level of impact that's been attributed to each. With that in mind, let's just come back up and have a look at a place where we're all perhaps a little bit more familiar, and that's looking at our request lists. So this is really important because it's context sensitive you know, based on the user that's logged in. So I'm logged in in this case as Graham, and Graham belongs to multiple teams. 
So he has the rights to look at requests that have been log uh, logged against any of the teams that he's a member of, or any tickets that have been raised against services that his team supports. He's also been given the rights to work with changes, problems, known errors and incidents. If he hadn't, he wouldn't see those icons. He wouldn't be seeing things that are greyed out. He would just see what's relevant to him. So if I want to look at all ticket types that belong to any of the teams that I belong to, I can set those, uh, set those selections. I can also use the multifunctional filter on the left-hand side to show me anything that's VPN related in the context of that search. Or if I want to have a look at what my colleague Brian is currently working on, I can use the same filter. Or if I happen to be on the phone to a customer, I want to see their active tickets that my teams are responsible for. Again, I can use that same filter option here. Now that's great when we talk about default options that are provided to you, but we also provide you with the ability for each analyst to build their own views and to share their views with our colleagues and teams. And we can do this in a non-technical way, so the analysts don't need to, un need to worry about understanding anything about the database structure that sits underneath this. They can just go ahead and build their own views using a very simplistic clause builder, well, in this example, I'm interested in high priority incidents. But if I wanted to look at those that have been logged against a particular service, I just follow the conditions, go in and say, show me everything that's a high priority incident against our desktop support service. Very quick and intuitive to use. But what I can also do with those, high, um, those views is build charts and content for my own personal dashboard. So here we've got a high priority incident view, but I might want to see which of my teams are actually responsible for those tickets or which individuals within those teams have actually got direct ownership. Maybe we're interested in looking at that view by which, uh, which of our sites are impacted, or if I wanted to create another view of that, I might want to have a look at which of my customers are actually impacted by that. So I'm going to create a donut chart here, preview that data. I've now got a split of that. And if I save that chart and come back to my request list, I can now toggle between my request list view and my personal dashboard view, which is going to show me that chart that I've just created. And because it is my personal dashboard, I can move things around, I can collapse them as need be. All of these items support drill down um, out of the box so I can get back to the underlying data. And if I want to drill into it or export it out to another format, those options are entirely mine. We'll have a look at our um, analytics and reporting options that sit above this um, as we get towards the end of the demo. But this leads us on quite nicely to where do I actually go and how do I raise requests in Service Manager? Well, first and foremost, we've already had a look at raising them via the self-service portal. The second option is the ability to raise tickets via email. And in Service Manager, your shared mailboxes can be visible on our platform. So if you've got a support at company or a IT at company uh, mailbox, any emails that are sent into that mailbox, you can view here. And from here, you can either uh, raise a new request or uh, apply that email to an existing request. We also support automation of that, so that we have a rules builder that allow you to automatically log a ticket from an email or automatically apply an email to an existing ticket if the reference number is in the subject line. The third option is raising requests via our fully published XML API, so you can do that from third-party tools. And the fourth option is coming in here and raising these requests manually. Just before I go ahead and raise that um, request and show you how the process works, there's two really key aspects that underpin Service Manager, and I'm just switching to the admin tool here to give you some visibility of that. So I'm just drilling into the application, and the two areas I'm interested in are business processes and our progressive capture. Progressive capture is all about the logging experience, and the business processes are all about the fulfillment side once that ticket has been logged. And the first thing to comment here is that we do ship with out-of-the-box instant problem change uh, business processes, but as you can see in this list, clearly I can come in and create my own. I can share those or lock them down if I don't want people uh, editing or playing around with those. But the key aspect here is that it's not prescriptive in terms of how our business processes work. Uh, maybe some examples of that would be if you were working with incidents and you wanted to create a business process that had service levels in there, we're not going to dictate that you have to use a response in a fixed timer. We're not going to dictate that they have to start at a certain point and they'll be marked at a certain point. You can come in and choose A, if you want to use them, B, if you want to use fix and response, and C, when they start and what constitutes them being achieved. All of that is configurable. You can build your processes using this drag and drop canvas where you can come in, add your nodes, and visualize the processes. You can build your processes into multiple stages, which will be reflected by a graphical heads-up display that we briefly saw on the self-service portal, but I'll show you in a second. But this is all about 
tasks, routings, email notifications, decisions, authorizations, and various other system actions that can be governed and controlled here. Um, but all of that power is certainly passed down to yourselves. We wouldn't expect you to need consultants to come in and build this for you. And the great thing about all of this is all of that complexity is then hidden away from the users behind the graphical heads up display, which we'll have a look at in a second. Coming back out of those business processes though and looking at the progressive capture, this is absolutely to do with the logging experience. What we've done here is move away from the traditional um, service management forms where you've got lots and lots of fields. Some people call them spreadsheets and steroids almost, and much more aligned to what you do in your consumer lives. If you were booking a holiday online, um, if you were taking out car insurance, whatever it might be, you'll go to one of these websites and they will simply guide you through a series of questions, one at a time, and based on your answers, it'll ask you a, a linked question. And we're, again, just providing you the facility here to graphically build the questions and the order and the branching points for those decisions when you're logging a ticket. So let's have a look at how that progressive capture actually looks like in um, practice. So we'll come back to our um, analyst view. And I could come in here and I could say I'm on the phone and I want to log an incident. I think it's an incident that the user is calling about. But what happens, in fact, it was actually a service request they were calling about. Do I have to ask them to repeat themselves while I open the relevant form? Or do I convert the incident into a service request? All of those are time-consuming aspects. So what we have here is the ability to actually use our raise new option. And here we'll actually collate and collect the data before deciding what type of request we want to raise it as. So the first thing I'm going to do here is, is log this ticket against Steve. But is it actually a ticket that Steve's calling about? Is he not simply looking for an update on one of his active tickets? If he was, I can drill into one of his active tickets, give him the information and move on. But if it was a new ticket that he was logging, uh, calling about, what services does Steve take from us? If it was uh, an issue with his Mac, are any of those um, request catalog items relevant? Has he just had it upgraded? Do I want to log it against that particular catalog item? Or if it was something slightly more generic, desktop support, what questions do I need to ask to capture the relevant information? And here we're going to be guided through that experience. So I'm just going to keep it generic here once it has a VPN issue, unable to connect. Uh, off the back of that, maybe I've got a question that says, OK, well, do I know enough at this point to raise it as an instant or a, a change or a service request? Just playing devil's advocate here, I could go ahead and say, well, I'll raise this as a change, even though it's clearly not. And it's going to ask me one question about uploading supporting documents. But if I go back up and actually say I want to raise this as an incident, it's then going to guide me through the instant specific questions. I'm going to choose the category on this occasion. I'm going to choose a priority. Perhaps you make these mandatory for your users. It's entirely up to you. And I could come in here and I could associate one or multiple of the customer's assets at this point. But the key thing here is it validates and guides me through the process, the logic being that there shouldn't be any training overhead for you to put people in front of this to log the tickets. It should be very, very intuitive. Once I've raised that ticket and we've used whatever um, prefixes we want for our tickets, so on this occasion I've got IN for an instant or CH for a change, I'll go ahead and view that request. Now, looking at this request, I can see the graphical heads-up display, which, um, which denotes the business process that we've just created for this particular uh, catalog item or service that we've logged this against. And we can see our stages represented, and we can see the various checkpoints, which denote what's happened so far and what needs to happen next. So I can see that it's been automatically assigned to the correct resolver team. The priority has been picked up as being set during progressive capture. So now it's taken me in context on my action bar, to where I need to go to perform the next action, which is someone in that team to actually take ownership. So if I come in here as Graham, pick up that particular ticket, what that's then going to do is mark that checkpoint as being achieved, move me on to the next stage, and in this particular example, it's created an, inc an activity within that incident for either the owner, a named individual, a role, or a group to go ahead and do a particular task on this request. Now I'll come back to the automation in a second, but there's a heck of a lot of manual options that you've got available to you here. So whether it's putting updates in, whether it's taking screenshots um, and pasting those in, so this could be the error. All of these things are nice and intuitive to do. I can drag and drop multiple items in at uh, any given time. All of those um, actions then appear in the timeline for this particular request. But there's a lot of the collaborative stuff that we, we talked about through some, with Simon's introduction. So if I want to follow this request, on my timeline and see any updates to it, regardless of whether I own it or not, I can do that. I can obviously work on this ticket until I've done everything I need to on it, and then I can assign it away. Or I can create other activities for other users. 
Or what I could do is, in fact, more informally, invite in the subject matter expert that I want to involve in this particular request. So here I could invite Rosemary in as a particular expert, and then I might want to go ahead and mention Rosemary. I can see she's offline at the moment, but hopefully when she's back online, she'll be able to come in and assist. Rosemary, can you help here? So what this will then do is send Rosemary the notifications that she's been added and, and, and what she needs to do. It could be that Rosemary doesn't normally have the rights to look at my tickets, so I could actually elevate her rights just for this request to get her assistance on it, but she wouldn't be able to look at any other tickets that are with my team or a particular ticket type if she didn't have those rights. Other options you've got available here are adding in other customers as impacted or interested users, and I could if I wanted to go ahead uh, and raise link requests from here. So I'll just do that just for, uh, for argument's sake here. I'm just going to raise a, uh, a raise uh, change off the back of this. I'm going to log it against the same service. I'm going to make some assessments about the type of change it is and who's impacted, just to demonstrate the different type of progressive capture that's available uh, on here. And this isn't really to go to any further than this, but just to demonstrate that the, the UI is going to be very familiar. It's actually the heads-up display and the business processes that are going to govern and control the behavior of this particular request. But if we are talking about changes, another view on how you might want to look at your change process or all of the tickets that are in flight against that change process is against our graphical boards. So this is where each system user can come in here and build a board that reflects their processes or other uses. So here my change process might have various life cycle stages, all the changes that are incoming, those that are waiting to be assessed, those that are sat with CAB, waiting to be approved and in progress. This gives me a bird's eye view, a real time view of all the changes that are running against that process at any given time. And using our business process, we can automate the movement of those changes between the stages without the need for any human or manual intervention. And as you can see here, you've also got the option to move them manually. But those boards could also be used to underpin your service level management. So on here, for argument's sake, I might have a um, service level running that's firing off email reminders and increasing priorities and reassigning the ticket as it gets near its targets. But we can also have the tickets automatically pushed onto our breach board where I can see things breaching today and the next hour or half an hour already have or any other parameters that you decide to build into that particular uh, condition. So here we've, we've sort of had a look at some of the service management capabilities. We've also got complementary applications that are available on the platform as well. Configuration Manager gave us the visual, visual representation um, of the relationships between services and tickets. We've also got timesheet management so we can look at all of the time that's being spent across the different requests and activities uh, on the platform. And the platform also provides us with other features, such as uh, where all my activities are, regardless of the application that I'm using, or one-to-one -one conversations, so instant messaging that's provided on that platform as well. But all of this then gets wrapped up and presented back through my newsfeed, which is really the place that your analysts can go to see information that they're interested in um, based on the, <coughs> excuse me, based on the items that they're either following or workspaces that they're members of. So this particular user is a member of a major instant workspace, which is automatically getting information posted to it once major instants are reported. Or a change management workspace where changes that have been approved and then have been implemented and been reviewed can automatically be pushed up and that information can be notified. But we can also use these workspaces for what Simon described as our tacit knowledge, where we might want to provide a more formal environment for our users to be able to come in Rather than discussing issues by the coffee machine or via email, we can give them a facility where they can come in and say, look, my customer's got this issue. Your colleagues can then come in in their local language and say, these are the answers. This should potentially help your customer. We can validate those answers. So here we can see Brian, Daniel, and James have said, actually, Pablo's answer is much more credible than Pierre's on this occasion. So James, please go ahead and use that answer for your customer. Now, that's great in the here and now because it solves James' customer's issue. But by having all that information stored on the platform, if I wanted to look for anything else that was relating to our VPN software in the future, I can use the global search option at the top that's going to find me relevant matches against all of that workspace content. And if I really wanted to narrow this down to say, just show me anything that's been posted in the last six months since we upgraded our VPN software, or just show me what Daniel's posted because he's the expert in this particular area, or just limit it to a particular workspace, show me any questions, show me the answer, and here Brian's provided an answer. Again, Daniel, Pablo, and Pierre have all validated that, so we can go ahead and use that knowledge. But as we also said, it's not just about this tacit knowledge, it's also about structured knowledge. 
So here we can look in our documents and we could possibly go looking for our uh, change management process and I can go ahead and have a look at that document. Against that document, all the things I'm sure you'd expect to see, you've got uh, life cycle stages of that document being active, retired or, or available. We can share that document with our colleagues to actually work on that document before it's published. We can give rights as to who can edit or view it. We keep full revision histories so that there's only ever one version of this document in circulation at any given time. That means that we're replacing the issue where you've got various versions of that document on your network shares or you're passing a document around via email and you're never really sure which version you're working on it. You can check out these documents for editing, lock them so other users can't um, access them at the same time, and you can add those tags which makes searching for these a lot easier. But once you're ready to publish that, push that up into the wider libraries and the wider communities that have rights to those libraries can go ahead and view those particular documents. So with all that in mind, we've looked at a lot of the capabilities here, but one of the key aspects is how do I get data out of here once I put all this information in and I'm using it to log my requests and hold all my knowledge. So one of the options here is looking at our advanced analytics in the admin tool. And this will give you the ability to leverage our trending engine, which will allow you to build your own measures. And measures are things like you know, how many tickets you've resolved or logged on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. What's your average resolution time? What's your first time fix rate look like? And when you're building those measures, you want to set targets for them and then to see how you're performing against those targets against um, intervals, daily, weekly, monthly, whatever it is. And on here, we can visualize the performance against those targets as well as the trend line to see whether we're still going up or down against that target. And once we've got those trending um, calculations happening, we can come back and we can build widgets based off those measures and we can create charts, data lists, target counters. Once we've got those widgets in place, we can add them onto dashboards. We can share those dashboards with individuals and roles. We can wallboard those dashboards. Well, the quickest way just to demonstrate that for the purposes of today is also showing you that you've got the ability to daisy chain multiple dashboards together to allow you to share, share a lot of data uh, at any given time. So I'm just going to let this transition through a few of the screens to give you a feel for some of the uh, output that you can expect using the analytics. And then once we finish rolling through this, I'm going to pass back to Simon that's going to look at a few of the uh, non-functional uh, benefits of working uh, with Hornbill. So here we're just seeing some information about knowledge uh, articles that have been looked at and search terms that have been used. But you've also got the ability to see how you're performing against your SLAs in and out and percentage-wise on here. But at this point, I'm just going to um, hand you back to Simon uh, to finish off the presentation. Thanks, Steve, for that comprehensive overview of Service Manager. So, as Steve said, I just want to talk to you about some of the non-functional benefits of Hornbill and why Hornbill. And what we have here is three of our core values. First of all, customer first. Everything we do is um, evolves around our customer being at first thought in our mind. That's whether that's the application, the service we offer, or any engagement or um, experience you have with us. So we're always thinking of putting our customers first in everything we do. Two, collaboration, partnership through collaboration, as Steve uh, demonstrated, you know, collaboration is what we do as part of our proposition. Uh, we certainly use that within our organisation. But equally, collaboration is a way of uh, defining our product. So earlier we talked about uh, our continual software deployment and our agile methodology about uh, delivering functionality and updates to our customers. Well, the partnership through collaboration means that uh, customers can collaborate with our teams, and with other aspects of our organization. And through the forums, it helps us to define our product so that it becomes better and better over time. So again, collaboration is very key to us. And finally, quality, not compromise. Um, hope, certainly you've seen through Steve's demonstration, it, it's a product of high quality, but also the service and any engagement is of high quality. And obviously we look for no compromise in anything that we do going forward. Now, just an area I wanted to touch upon is uh, the 30-day guarantee. What we've done at Hornbill is when we reflected about um, this, the application and how we wanted to engage new technologies and techniques, we also looked at how we engage our customers and how we actually deliver our solution. And what we wanted to do was provide you with a risk-free approach. Um, and how we've done that is we've actually looked at the way that we can actually deliver this solution to you. And I just want to explain how we go about doing that. So essentially, put us to the test. Now, the first aspect is what we would do is we'd make our service available to you for 30 days. And what this means is typically within a procurement process, it's normally uh, a paper-based process or a series of demos. But 
you never get to the actual, um, should I say, under the hood of the product to actually understand how process works, how reports are created. So what we've done is with this 30 days, it gives you exactly that. You're able to actually look at the functional uh, gap uh, between your requirements and what we can offer. You can look at how processes are built, how intuitive the interface is, how reports are uh, created. So again, essentially we give you the opportunity to actually really explore the application before any uh, further engagement. We also, as part of that 30 days, offer you a free implementation. Now here at Hornbill, we believe that you shouldn't be charged to actually stand up your uh, solution. And by that, what we mean is we'll actually put your data in, we'll build some processes, and we'll actually get the solution into a state that you can really consider it as a viable solution for your organization. To add to that, we offer free training. Now, free training has two aspects. We're going to train you through a training package, which is built into the free implementation, so that you can actually utilize all the functionality. And if going forward you do take on the service, you'll be fully equipped to actually administer and configure the solution. But equally, it informs you to make an intuitive choice within the 30 days where the service manager is a solution for you. Finally, at the end there's a choice, accept and reject. You have the opportunity to start subscribing. But equally, if you find that it isn't for you, then you've, uh, you've worked through an exercise to fully understand the solution. And as you can see, 95% of our customers' uh, prospects actually sign up. The five that don't, well, that's fine. That means that they've worked through the process. There's something they found that um, means that it's not a solution for them. We part company happily, and we can all move on. So, again, put us to the test. The idea here is that you really can uh, get used to the application, and you can align it to your business requirements. Now, the Hornbill difference, I think uh, we've talked about uh, innovation around technology. We've also talked about um, the, the way we actually go about allowing you to have a, a satisfaction guarantee of 30 days to actually test the solution. But what, you know, here are some of the real non-functional benefits that I think really stand out and should be considered whenever buying a solution. Software is not a, a versus service. Well, this is a service. Um, again, update, uh, updates are going to be made available to you. There's no hidden cost about upgrades going forward. Customizations, process design keep working. You're always on the latest functionalities. You're always getting the latest features, and there's no service um, interruptions. And again, what we want you to do is concentrate on supporting your customers, and we'll concentrate on supporting you. Price for life. Um, transparency around pricing. Uh, effectively, I talked about challenges at the beginning. A lot of our customers have spoken to us about hidden cost prices going up in the second and third year. What we have, we have predictable pricing. You know what the solution is going to cost year on year. And also, we've got clauses in our contract, which means you're absolutely insulated for any price increase. Equally, if we reduce the cost of the service, you have the opportunity to take advantage of that as well. Training, um, a challenge again, you know, when people get promoted or leave, a lot of organizations use that as the catalyst to go back out to market. What we commit to doing is train for life. So again, your subject matter expert that's been trained up in service manager moves on or is promoted. Um, we guarantee that we will come in and train someone else up to that level. Why? Because it means you continually carry on getting the value for the solution. So again, free training for life with service manager. And fi finally, um, I talked about um, quality, not compromise. Again, no contractual time. So what we're saying here is that at any moment in time, you can walk away from us. Now, what that does is it really does drive behavior within the whole organization that we are always providing quality solutions to you. You know, everything we do is about providing a solution and a first-class service to you. So, again, no contractual tie-ins, and, again, that really does help us to look at functionality and enhancement that are very much driven by our customers, you know, rather than our developers coming up with great functionality, which they do all the time, which we do implement. We equally can make sure it's home in the direction that you want to do. Finally, cost, transparent costing. So again, whether it's a small organization, large team, um, the simple price is around um, per user per month. So again, with, 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 with service manager, you're either consuming or providing. If you're uh, consuming, typically you come through a portal, and again, that's free. If you're providing, it's through a subscription model that is based on £42.50 per calendar month. Equally, that cost is tied into a transparent uh, pricing plan. So essentially, the more you buy, the cheaper you get. And again, we talked about price for life, but it, essentially what you're buying into is the green curve, whether you increase or decrease your usage, 
it would be tied into that curve. So again, no hidden costs, you know exactly what you're buying, it's all predictable. A lot of the financial people love to hear that, but again, it's something that we really wanted to promote to our customer base. Now, hopefully um, throughout the demonstration, there's either been some questions that uh, you've posted or you're thinking about, but certainly me and Steve now would be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have or provided today. Great, thanks Simon. So it looks like we've got a, a couple of questions that have come up here. Um, obviously you, you talked quite a bit there about obviously it being a SaaS based cloud solution. The question here about where our data centers are, so I'm happy to take that one. Okay. Um, so again it's going to depend on the region of the customer, but if, certainly if you're in the EU, in the uh, UK, then our data centers are in the UK. Um, as are any of the backups as well, so your data will not leave uh, EU. If you happen to be a customer in the US, we have obviously data centers out there with the relevant accreditation uh, on here. Uh, another question here, looking specifically at assets. Um, so can we import assets? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we give you a couple of mechanisms to bring assets into Service Manager. One is that you can use um, the, uh, the provided CSV imports. Um, you can upload the data that way. Or we also have a scheduled utility that you can run locally against, I don't know, an SCCM or any other MySQL and a SQL backend database and push that information securely into your instance on a scheduled basis using our, our APIs. It's just picking up, maybe you can ask this one, Steve. There's one question around Active Directory and can we pull our user data from AD? Absolutely. So again, on a you know, if you wanted to have it set up on a nightly basis to bring in new users, updates to existing users, all of that can be um, uh, facilitated and we also use the SAML protocol to enable a transparent single sign-on for both your analyst community and also your end user community as well. Okay, well that, that seems to be all the questions. So again, um, I think we'll wrap up now okay. and I'll just pass you back to Sarah. Thank you Stephen and Simon for taking us through that presentation. I hope everyone found it useful. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me or, or your relationship manager. Finally, thank you everyone for your time today. Goodbye. Bye.